Hi, Jimmy Johnson. How are you? I'm doing just fine, at least. I am from uh, Sports and Culture Media, and my first question is, for one, you coach with the Dallas Cowboys, America's team, a longtime fan. So what was your most memorable moment being out there on the on the sidelines with the team? Well, I, you know, obviously, you know, the first Super Bowl was special, and, and I think the thing that made it so special is that we had come from taking a team that had three straight losing seasons. Uh, we didn't improve much that first year. We were one in 15 ourselves. Uh, but uh, going from the very bottom of the NFL in a short period of time and then winning the Super Bowl. And that first Super Bowl, I, I don't think I've ever coached a game where I was as confident about winning it as I was in that game. I, I knew that Buffalo turned the ball over a lot and we didn't turn the ball over. And so I you know, felt like if we could just hang in there early, it'd be a matter of time before we took control of the game because of the turnovers. All right, thank you. All right, Mark, you're up and then James Harris. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, let me first say congratulations on getting into the Hall of Fame. Uh, watching that live on television, that raw emotion was just beautiful. Um, I have so many questions for you. I think about the only way I could get them in is to get a cooler beer and head out on, <laughs> and go fishing with you. <laughs> but um, leaving the University of Miami and coming to the Dallas Cowboys, and at that time they were basically broke, busted, and thoroughly disgusting to watch. Having gone from the pinnacle down to the depths, what was that like? And the second part of this question would be, I uh, played football at JMU with Charles Haley and knowing the character that he is and all the personalities that you had with the Cowboys, how were you able to mold them and keep them focused on the grand prize, which was winning? Well, you know, first of all, you know, you know, people look back on it and, and they say it was an easy decision to leave University of Miami. You know, but, you know, we had gone through four straight seasons where we played a national schedule and been on national television every other week and only lost two regular season games. And so we had a powerhouse football team and I knew it was going to continue that way because we had a great, you know, group of talent. And then going to Dallas, you know, Tom Landry is one of the greatest coaches of all time, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, they had had three straight losing seasons there at the bottom of the NFL at three and 13 because they just didn't have any talent. And, you know, and obviously there were some older players that uh, helped us, uh, you know, in winning our Super Bowls. But a lot of it had to do with, you know, I, I brought in Tony Wise, my offensive line coach. And he, he put together what is considered one of the greatest offensive lines in, in NFL history. But he did it with a, a free agent defensive tackle, Mark Tuanay at left tackle. He did it with a left guard where the previous stats, staff said get rid of him because he was too fat, Nate Newton. <laughs> we took a, a third round pick, a 245 pound offensive guard. I asked Tony, I said, can you convert him to a center? He said, I'll make him into a center. So we moved St uh, Stepnoski to center. Uh -huh. And then we took a seventh round pick, Kevin Gogan, uh, who had struggled his early years. We moved him to guard and took a third round pick, Eric Williams at right tackle. So, you know, those players hadn't developed, but Tony Wise was able to develop them into a great offensive line. And so, you know, the combination of having some great assistant coaches and acquiring a lot of talent with 51 trades in five years, we were able to win that Super Bowl. So it was a great feeling. Thank you very much on that. I'll follow up about Charles Haley. Yes, he's a character. <laughs> he's he is a, a character, character but he is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, you know, Charles and I developed a great relationship after a few uh, rocky roads uh, there early in his career at Dallas. Uh, we had a couple of run-ins, but we, we really got together. You know, really, he came into my office after I had berated him a, a couple of times at, at one of the ball games, and he said, Coach, he said, if you will just – get on to me one-on-one -on -one in your office. He said, I'll do anything in the world for you. I, I love playing for you. He said, but just don't embarrass me in front of the other players. And I said, you know, Charles, I, I may not always be able to do that, but I'll try. But from that time forward, we had a great relationship. And 
he was a big part of us winning Super Bowls. Thank you very much. And how about them Cowboys? <laughs> I should have trademarked that. <laughs> James Harris and then Steve Wine. Thanks, Rich. Uh, James Harris with Sports Stars of Tomorrow. Jimmy, congratulations. Obviously, uh, your time with the Cowboys was really mercurial. It was it was great, but it, yet it was so short. <laughs> and, you know, you, you came in, it was really lightning in a bottle. You brought up a lot of good points with those players that you mentioned. But you also were the really the only coach that could go from the college level to the pro level and if it seemed like you just had a book on guys that others didn't, for instance, trading up to get Emmett Smith at 18 or 17 or wherever it was, you had that benefit of recruiting so many of these guys. And so you really, the, the league changed about that time. You had Landry going out, you had Gibbs at the end. You were the first of those new young coaches. Do you ever stop and look back and think, man, five more years there. <laughs> could have been a could have been a Belichick New England situation, right? Maybe could have got a couple more. Do you, what, what are your thoughts back on the on that time? Well, you know, Troy has mentioned that to me two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we just you know we just did it our way. We didn't know any other way to do it. I was my own recruiting coordinator and, and personnel director at Oklahoma State and University of Miami, and so I was you know kind of responsible for evaluating talent. You know, I signed Jimmy Jones, University of Miami. He didn't play a senior year in high school, didn't have another scholarship offer. I signed Russell Maryland, didn't have a scholarship offer. Uh, Chudzinski uh, didn't. And so, you know, we were able to get some players that uh, that were really not recruited. But now we, we signed some players that were highly recruited as well. You know, Jesse Armstead, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, that's, you know, what I did was I evaluated talent and, you know, so a lot of the league back then, you know, coaches coached, uh, personnel directors handled the personnel and general managers managed the team. Well, you know, we didn't operate that way. Um, I put my coaches on the road evaluating talent. Uh, we made those decisions along with the scouts. And so we were able to upgrade the talent. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we, we developed that talent because you know, a lot of the league, there was two or three teams, I think the Redskins, maybe Kansas City, two or three of the teams worked year around with their players. Uh, when I first went there, we had an outdoor weight room. And I asked uh, Bob Ward, our strength coach, I said, you know, where's our players? He said, coach, it's, it's cold here in Dallas. He said, our players don't work out here. Uh, he said, I'll see them uh, for our um, mini camp. But I'm, the coaches really don't work the mini camp. Uh, I'm the only one I check their weights and I run them a little bit. But that's the only work they do in the offseason here at the complex. And I say, well, that's going to change. And, you know, we, we enclosed the weight room and I required our players to be there five days a week. We worked out on the field um, three days a week and then we lifted weights four days a week. And, you know, I remember, you know, the great uh, writer, Frank Luxa, he told me, he said, he said, Jimmy he said, you, you're going to run these players into the ground. He said, by the time they get to December, you know, they're not going to be able to play again anymore. And I said, they're, they're young guys. They can handle it. <laughs> uh, but so we, you know, we did some things different, but that, you know, that's the only way we knew how to do it. Thanks, Jimmy. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Steve Wine and then uh, Samuel Rodriguez, you're next. Jimmy, nice to see you. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. <laughs> um, what uh, what made Jimmy Johnson a Hall of Fame coach? And then I have a second question, if I may. You know, just the same words that came out you know, when Dave Baker told me I was going to the Hall of Fame. I said, the first thought that goes through my mind is all the great players and great assistant coaches that I work with. Uh, it wasn't just Jimmy Johnson. It, when I went into the College Football Hall of Fame, uh, you know, really I had some great players and, and great coaches. Now, maybe I had something to do with bringing them together, you know, but those players won the games. Now, I went into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Well, I went into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame because of, you know, Terry Bradshaw and Michael Strahan, Howie Long, Kurt Menefee, Jay Glazer, you know. That's the reason I, I went into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame is those people. 
and you know, for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's the same thing. I, I think I, I coached or drafted or recruited 14 Pro Hall of Famers. I, I worked with, you know, either in broadcasting or coaching or in some type of organization uh, with 13 more Hall of Famers. I mean, you know, 27 Hall of Famers that I've been associated with. And so it's really the people that I've been associated with. That's what put me in the Hall of Fame. When you give your uh, thank yous at your induction speech, will Jerry Jones be among the people you'll be thanking? And, and why yeah. or why not? You know, I'm, I've tried to put together a list. Of, you know, without question, Jerry played a large part uh, of my career. I mean, that was part of a great organization. And I've got tremendous respect for Jerry. Jerry Jerry's one of the more passionate, hardest working guys, and he loves the Cowboys uh, that I've been around. Smartest businessman I've ever been around. Uh, but as far as putting the thank yous together, I don't know that I can come up with a list. I mean, there's too many. I mean, there, you, you, when you look at, I, I coached about 13 different colleges. You know, I, you know, when you start from day one, you know, going all the way to Buckshot Underwood, who was my coach at uh, Fort Arthur and Thomas Jefferson High School, he was an assistant for Bear Bryant. He gave me my start. You know, I mean, when you start all the way back to high school, you know, University of Arkansas, all the colleges that I coached, I mean, all the places where I've worked, and, you know, there's no way in the world that I can put together a list of all the people I need to thank. Thank you again. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. We'll go next to Samuel and then Don Stenson. Hey, Jimmy. This is Samuel Rodriguez at New Stitch Media. So winning two Super Bowls, a national championship, and coaching multiple teams, you must have plenty of stories that you could tell about these teams and different coaching moments. Do you have a favorite one? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I've got lots of stories, and a lot of them I can't tell. But uh, um, I, I don't have any any real favorite stories. I, I, I think if you, you picked a team or a, a player or an era, you know, uh, maybe I'd have a story. But as far as a favorite, uh, every day was a favorite for me. I, I, I love doing what I did. I love coaching. I love dealing with the players. Um, even some of the hard times. Uh, I, I think having some of those hard times, going one in 15, uh, made us all appreciate uh, winning those Super Bowls even more uh, because we went through the rough times. I, I remember after I, my last game, my first year, we played the Packers and it was freezing. All the restrooms were frozen up you know they did pipes were busting there in texas stadium you know I, brenda bushnell who i brought in to do our tv work she said coach you know we'll tape your tv show tomorrow i said brenda i i am spent i'm totally exhausted um i said physically and mentally i've got nothing nothing left i said i, I can't do the tv show tomorrow i'm gonna grab Rhonda. We're going to get on a plane. We're going to the Bahamas. I got to get away. I mean, but I mean, I actually, I broke down and started crying. I mean, I was just totally spent after that first year. And so, I mean, that's not necessarily an uplifting positive story, but it tells you a little bit about what we went through. I mean, we, all, all we knew the whole time I'd been coaching was win, 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 win. And to go through such a, you know, such a difficult season that first season. Now, on the positive side that season, during that 1-15 in 15 season, I had Dave Wanstead and Tony Wise and Butch Davis. We were at a little restaurant uh, not too far from Valley Ranch. And, and I said, guys, I said, just hang with me. I said, I told you when we were at, you know, Oklahoma State University, I said, we're going to win a national championship. Well, we ended up winning a national championship, you know, eventually at University of Miami. I said, if you will hang with me, we've made some moves this year to upgrade the talent. You hang with me and be positive. We're going to win us a Super Bowl. Now, it might have sounded like a crazy man, you know, going through one in 15, telling his assistants he's going to win a Super Bowl. But it tells you a little bit about our belief of what we were going to accomplish. Let's go to Don Stenson, and then next will be Darren Gant. Congratulations, Coach. Thank you. Legend has it that the Hall of Fame busts talk at night amongst themselves. 
<laughs> when your bus goes in, who would your bus talk to and why? That's a wild question. I, I don't think my bus would say it much. I, I think my bus would be listening to all those great uh, individuals in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, I think my bus would be smart enough just to listen to those great people. Thanks, Coach. Let's go to Darren Gant and then Calvin Watkins. Jimmy, you had an opportunity to uh, go fishing with Matt Rule, and it made me wonder, when you were thinking about your transition from the college game to the pros, were there lessons you learned a year into it, and, and what were those that kind of helped you adapt to dealing with professional players? Yeah, Terry Bradshaw asked me on the show one time, he said, uh, can you kind of compare, you know, college coaching to pro coaching? And I said, Terry, I said, there's not a world of difference. There's a galaxy of difference. Uh, as, a, as a college coach, you know, I was a mentor. I was a kind of a father figure. You know, I, I did a tremendous amount of counseling with the players. You know, they were young kids that had left home for the first time in their life. Uh, all the pressures of getting a college education, the pressures of the girlfriend, the pressures of living away from their family. So my relationship with the players was a heck of a lot different than professional players who are really, you know, they're dictated by financial reasons. There's a business, uh, their agents are influencing them. So it's a completely different relationship. You know, the length of the season, you know, you could take probably the top 10 to 15 colleges and uh, in the program, just like we were in University of Miami. Uh, my wife, Rhonda, probably could have won eight or nine games, but, you know, I, I didn't even need to show up. We had so much talent. Uh, in pro football, uh, if you try to do the same things in pro football and you turn the ball over three or four times, you're going to get beat. I don't care who you're playing. Uh, and the difference between the worst team and the best team in pro football is very, very small. Whereas in college football, like I said, if you're at the top, you know, 10 or 12 schools, you're, you're going to win eight or nine, you know, just by playing pretty good. You're not going to have to be at your best. You're going to have to be at your best for maybe three, three games a year. Uh, so there's a big difference, the length of the season. I, I remember Steve Spurrier, uh, he, he went to the, uh, Washington football team, and he said, okay, he looked at the fields, and he said, and, and uh, this is going to be the offensive field, I guess, is that the defensive field down there? And somebody said, defensive field? We only got 50-something players. We're all on one field. You don't have you don't have 110 players like you had at, at Florida, <laughs> and there's only one field out here, <laughs> and uh, so it's a, it's a really, you know, structuring your practices, making sure you don't overwork the players, the off-season program. It, I mean, it, it's really a, a different world in professional football. Calvin Watkins, and on deck will be Brian Dardo. Hey, Jimmy, uh, when you think about the success you had in Dallas, how big was that Herschel Walker trade and just setting the tone, just getting things turned around there, or the start of it? You know, a lot of people point to the Herschel Walker trade, and, and obviously at the end result, uh, you, you know, we, we got, you know, three or four players out of it, uh, maybe even five, four or five players. Uh, but people, to, even today, they don't understand the trade. You know, they thought that we got five players and five picks and all that stuff. Well, every player was tied to a pick. And the players that Minnesota gave us were all, you know, they were players that they could get rid of and, and not really affect their football team. Jesse Solomon with a bad knee. Isaac Holt, you know, he was an older player. David Howard was an older, try-hard guy. You know, now those, as we it turned out we kept those three players, but they were really weren't part of the Super Bowl run. You know, we made the trade for one reason, to get the picks. Uh, and, you know, we ended up getting, you know, four or five picks. Well, the key, you know, like the Rams had a similar type trade with Eric Dickerson, uh, but the key is not getting picks. Teams, you know, Cleveland, a lot of teams have gotten picks over the years. 
Uh, the key is picking the right players. And if you pick the right players, that's going to improve your football team. But that was one trade. You know, we made 51 trades in that five-year period. And so, you know, you know, I, I traded, you know, our starting quarterback right off the bat, Steve Pelour. I traded him to Carl Peterson uh, with Kansas City. I don't know. I, I can't remember. I think I got a three, maybe going to a two or something. Yeah, but I got a pick. And I took Steve Walsh knowing that I was going to trade him. I traded him for a one, two, and a three. Uh, you know, and so um, the Herschel Walker trade, without question, helped our football team. But that was just a small part of the turnaround with the Cowboys. Thanks, Calvin. Let's go to uh, Brian and then Rick Watson. Hey, Coach. Congratulations. Um, I uh, read your book over the summer. It's a pretty good book. Actually, Coach Cross Country, we yell fatigue makes cowards of us all about every day. Our guys are getting tired <laughs> of it. But uh, if I have time, uh, we'll get a two-part question. First of all, you really talk a lot about your self-fulfilling prophecy, which I think is really interesting. Do you have one example of how that really did help one individual player? I, you know, really the Pygmalion effect and the self-fulfilling prophecy, I, I, I think it's, it's more of our approach to our players and our football team. Uh, you know, when I was at University of Miami, I recruited a lot of inner city kids. You know, their, their parents hadn't even finished high school, much less going to college. And every Thursday night, I would have a meeting with them, and I'd talk to them about graduating from college and what they were going to do uh, when they got out of college. And my approach was they were going to get their diplomas. Well, we improved the graduation rate from 51% to 88%, and it stayed that way ever since I left with the academic counseling and the mandatory study hall and mandatory class attendance. You know, and, and but that's how we approached it. You know, a lot of coaches, you know, they kind of poor math. Oh, we'll have a tough time against this team. We're going to have, you know, I don't know that we can score a point against this team, et cetera. Well, our approach was completely different. You know, our approach was, hey, guys, we're going to kick their ass because we're better than they are. You know, and, you know, and no different, you know, than when we played the 49ers. Uh, we were a better football team uh, that second year. We weren't the first time we played them, the first NFC championship game. They were the better team. We were the better team that day and won the game. But the next year, we were the better team, even though Troy was hurt and we had Bernie Kozar as our quarterback. Uh, you know, before the game, you know, I'm listening to Dan Reeves talk to Randy Galloway, and he's saying, you know, you know, I don't know who's going to win one thing or another. And that's why I called in and said, hey, I, I'll clear this up. We're going to win the game. You know, and, you know, you can put it in three-inch headlines. We're going to win the game. Well, that was the Pygmalion effect. Uh, I know when I walked into the complex the next day, I didn't realize it was going to cause such a, a stir. But, you know, Emmett looked at me and said, Coach, he said, uh, you wrote the check. I guess we're going to have to cash it. <laughs> uh, but I put the pressure on the players and I put the expectation on this is what I expect from you. Uh, and so there was never any doubt in my mind uh, that we were going to win. And I wanted them to think the same thing. Hey, Coach, how are you? It's uh, Rick Watson with uh, Big Dog Sports Talk. Uh, congratulations, first and well, foremost. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Of fame. It's really cool. Hey, I have a question just if you would talk about the relationship with Troy and, and how important was that and how important is that for a head coach and a quarterback to have that mutual trust, even if at certain times you may not see eye to eye on everything? Well, Rick, you know, they, I, I think it's paramount. I, I think it's extremely important that the head coach and the quarterback are on the same page and have a feeling for one another. Uh, and it was difficult for me because, you know, I drafted Steve Walsh and, you know, that put me in a, a tough situation. I know Troy didn't like it at all, but I drafted Steve to make a trade. The thing about it, I had to walk a, a fine line between Troy and Steve because I didn't want to devalue Steve's trade value. You know, cause I, I couldn't just rave about Troy even though I knew he was our guy I couldn't rave about him. I had to kind of keep, you know, keep it quiet what I was going to do because I wanted other teams to, you know, step up and trade for Steve. And I, the whole time I had Steve, I was calling around the league trying to trade. I tried to trade him to the 49ers. In fact, that, that's what opened the door with Mike Lynn with Minnesota Vikings. I was trying to trade Steve to Minnesota. 
and uh, it went on and on. And, and finally, when I did make the trade um, with the New Orleans Saints for a one, two, and a three, then I could open up with Troy. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of tension that first year with Troy because, again, I had to walk such a fine line between the two quarterbacks. Uh, but then after I got you know, moved Steve on, um, I, I reached out with Troy. Um, you know, I used the excuse of, hey, setting up a fish tank with him. I went to his house. We drank a few beers. We went and, we went and got uh, some tropical fish. I set up his tank. We spent some time together and we bonded. And ever since that time, you know, we have come become closer and closer and closer. I, you know, not only, you know, do I have, you know, tremendous respect and appreciation of, of what he was able to accomplish, we've become ex extremely good friends. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. Alec, you're up, and then Quentin will be next. Thank you. Hey, Coach, what's doing? This is uh, Alec Lace here with First Class Fatherhood. Uh, my show focuses on fatherhood and family life. I just wanted to ask, um, was there a noticeable difference for you as a head coach coaching players that were dads as opposed to coaching players who weren't dads? And then what was it like to watch these players that came in and then eventually became fathers? Did that change their performance at all? Um, you know what? It, uh, I, I think as a, as a college coach, you know, you, you know the family relationship. You've been in their homes. You've dealt with their families. In professional football, I, you know, I, you know, I don't know that you get as close to them as to their families as, as what you probably could and, and it would be beneficial if you did. Um, I, I know as a dad, that's, that's pretty well what caused me to retire, you know, retire the first time with the Cowboys and then retire uh, with the Miami Dolphins was, I realized that, you know, as much time as I spent away from my family, it, it really hurt my family. And, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of coaches could delegate. A lot of coaches could spend less time at the office. And, you know, I, I just couldn't do it that way. I, if I had a job to do, I, I was going to stay there and work until the job was done. And so, you know, I wanted to be a dad. And, you know, like my youngest son really, really struggled for, for about 10 years. And now he is absolutely doing fantastic both sons Brent and Chad uh, but me retiring from football is what helped our relationship and me becoming a better dad thanks coach you know we're winding down folks with only a few minutes left in this session and many more hands than minutes so we will get to as many as we can apologize in advance to those we don't get to but Quentin why don't you go ahead and then Brian you're on deck hey coach how you doing congrats on the Hall of Fame induction. Thank you. I have two questions. What was your belief that the Cowboys could turn it around despite the fact they were 1-15 in your first year? And also, which teams were the toughest to prepare for regular season or postseason? Well, it, my belief came from not what was there. My belief came from our background. Uh, my assistant coaches and myself I knew that we were going to acquire talent uh, and I knew that they would be well coached. And so it was just a matter of time. Uh, and I had to fall back on our history, uh, on what we were able to accomplish before we went to the Cowboys. Uh, so that, that's how I knew we were going to turn it around. Uh, and, and the second question was, uh, oh, which teams? Uh, the teams that were gave me the biggest concern uh, was really the the ones that were at the top of the league. <laughs> My first year it was it was Philadelphia. Buddy Ryan used to say, "Hey, there's no East Carolinas in professional football." And I said, "No, buddy, we're East Carolina. <laughs> we were at the bottom of the league." But I got the last laugh. You know, I saw Buddy, and we became friends years later. And I said, "Buddy, I said, I don't think you ever won a playoff game." I said, "I I think I did win a couple of Super Bowls." So I got the last laugh. Brian, and then uh, Jeff Hathorn. Jimmy, uh, one of the guys you're getting inducted with next month is Jimbo Covert. He talked a lot about you yesterday and, and how you recruited him when he was at Pitt. Sounds like you were at Freedom High School enough that uh, the teachers maybe started giving you some assignments. Uh, 
What do you remember about uh, landing, helping to land Jimbo, and, and also, I guess, at the last moment, uh, making sure he didn't get swayed over to, to Joe Pa and Penn State? I, I, I watched Jimbo in those wrestling matches so much. I, I was so tired of sitting in that gym. I'd sit up there next to Danny Ford from Clemson and <laughs> recruiting Jimbo. I, I spent a lot of time in freedom, but uh, a bunch of those, a bunch of those Hall of Famers, like I said, there's 14, 14 Hall of Famers that I either recruited, you know, drafted or coached. So I know a little bit about Hall of Famers. But Jimbo was a great, great high school player. And of course, he ended up being a great player for us at Pitt. Uh, but I spent many an hour uh, with Jimbo Colbert getting him ready. Jeff Hathorn and then uh, Nate Davis. Jimmy, congratulations. I had a similar question, but I'll ask you, what did you take away from your, your brief time at Pitt? You know, it, it, uh, it was interesting. You know, you know most college uh, football teams are in small towns. And, you know, I'd been in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and Stillwater, Oklahoma, or before Stillwater. But, you know, I'd been in small towns, you know, Clemson, South Carolina, and so going to University of Pittsburgh was really interesting. First of all, we had a great team. We had some great, great players. Uh, had a great run there. Actually, Jackie Sherrill was the head coach, and Jackie had been my linebacker coach uh, when we uh, were at Iowa State University up in Ames, Iowa, another small town. Well, you know, being in a city like, like Pittsburgh, it kind of gave me the idea, you know, I, I went to Oklahoma State and then that's when I ran, you know, after five years, I ran into Sam Jankovic and they were having a difficult time hiring a coach because it was late, you know, after the season, it was in June. And he was asking me about, you know, these other coaches. I said, hey, you know, I wouldn't mind living in a city. I'd never been to Coral Gables in my life. Uh, he said, you'd be interested in University of Miami at this late date. You know, I, I hear you got Thurman Thomas and all these great players, you know, at Oklahoma State. And I said, yeah, I'd be interested in University of Miami. So I accepted the job right then and there without even going to Coral Gables before, before I found out that I was going to have to retain their entire coaching staff. And they were all pissed off because they wanted the job, not me. Uh, so I was a little, that was a rocky year that first year. Uh, but uh, Going to, you know, coaching at the University of Pittsburgh kind of opened up the door for me to want to be in the city. All right, let's go to Nate Davis, and uh, we'll probably wrap it up with Ms. Kraft. Hey, Coach, you, you touched earlier on your transition from Miami to Dallas. Uh, it might have been apples and oranges then. I don't know if it's apples to Granny Smith apples now, but I wanted to kind of ask what, what advice maybe you've given uh, Urban Meyer. He's got the quarterback in place like, like you did, but maybe – uh, what challenges you, for, you foresee for him in this day and age? What do you think he needs to do and kind of how you see that Jacksonville situation playing out? Well, knowing Urban, you know, Urban came down years ago, brought his son Nate, and we fished and we talked football, you know, all day. I actually, you know, Urban gave me a call this morning. And we talked. Uh, I'm going to go up there you know, during the training camp and watch and, you know, visit with him just a little bit. Uh, yeah, Urban's very thorough. Uh, Urban has spent his due diligence getting ready for this job. He, he knew what he was getting into when he accepted the job. Uh, we had numerous conversations during the job process, and I think he'll do a great job. He, he knows how important personnel is. Uh, he knows how to deal with people. He's a little frustrated right now because he spent so little time with the players. He's accustomed to being around the players all the time, and they weren't able to do that because – COVID-19 and, and the situation. Uh, but I think Urban will do a great job. Again, um, I don't know that he needs much advice from me because he's already uh, spent time getting ready for it. Thanks, Coach. We're going to have two more questions, everybody. Uh, Ms. Kraft will ask, and then we're going to close it out with Christopher. Hi, Jenny. This is Lori Kraft from Joe Boo Sports Report. Um, how is it down there in sunny Florida? It's great. I went fishing <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. Um, now that you're about to join Jerry Jones in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, um, how special would it be if you were um, inducted into the Cowboys Ring of Honor before the end of this football season? <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been asked that question quite a bit, and I think the media is more concerned about this than I am. <laughs> uh, 
uh, actually, you know, Jerry's told me numerous times that he was going to put me in the ring of honor. Uh, whenever he's in a good mood and he feels like it, he can do it. Well, we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And our last question, Coach, is going to come from Christopher. Hey, Coach Johnson. Thank you so much for taking my question today. I'm a big college football fan. My brother and I rooted for Florida State and Miami my whole entire life. And <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you about the, the rivalry between Florida State and Miami. And, you know, you guys, I saw you on the 30 for 30 talk about, you know, how great the, those games were. Like, one goes to the national championship, the other one goes to the CarQuest Bowl, whatever the heck after, you know, you know, if you lose, you know, one versus two. What was it like playing and coaching in that rivalry? Well, you know, Bobby Bowden opened my, opened my eyes that first year. You know, we, we opened up the season. We beat, beat Bo Jackson and Auburn, uh, we beat Florida uh, there at Tampa, and then, uh, you know, we come back and we're going to play Florida State at home. He ran all those reverses and reverse passes, and he had my head spinning and beat us pretty good that first year. Uh, but we figured that out after the first year. We beat him four straight after that. Uh, I, Bobby told I mean, I tell one story on Bobby. Uh, he was with uh, Barry Switzer and myself at an Orange Bowl, you know, Ring of Honor type thing, whatever it is, it's called. And, uh, you know, Bobby looked over at Barry and he says, Barry, you realize how many national championships we could have won if it hadn't been for this SOB? <laughs> because there for a four year period, the only games they lost was to Miami, Oklahoma and, and Florida State. Thanks coach, congratulations. Thank you. Coach, thank you for your time. We really appreciate uh, your generosity today and uh, the great answers. And uh, we are counting down the days, 22 days, we will see you in Canton, Ohio for a long awaited enshrinement to the Centennial class. Uh, we will be here with open arms. Okay, I enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Coach.